everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. What I want to talk about today is PLS. Um, PLS is an IBM in internal only programming language. There is a Wikipedia entry here and it says uh, it's a machine oriented programming language and I think by machine oriented what they really mean in this wiki entry by machine oriented is that it has no input output capabilities whatsoever so it's based like on pl1 as it says here it's very very similar to pl1 and pl1 is the programming language i spent most time on doing professional programming uh, back in the days and so I'm very comfortable with pl1 and but they say machine oriented because there is no input output pl1 has extensive input output capabilities but uh, pls doesn't kind of like pascal or rex Rex also has very limited uh, um, input output capabilities. And um, they designed it in the 60s IBM as an internals only uh, programming language, so, which means they never really released the compilers um, to the outside world. And uh, they it, it's famous for being the programming language into, in which uh, TSO is written in. So whenever we use TSO in uh, MVS 3.8, um, um, whenever we use TSO, we're actually using something that was written in PLS uh, for the first time on MVT. And so, of course, our MVS 3.8 will have a TSO that's written in PLS. And over time, IBM wrote or rewrote most parts of MVS and then, of course, OS 3.9 US in PLS. And later it was called, uh, the first incarnation was PLS, just simple PLS, then PLS2, which is what we're going to look at today, uh, an improved, much improved PLS compiler, then PLS3, then for a while it was called PLAS, like particularly during the 90s, and then lately, the last 20 years or so, it's been called PLX, um, and uh, it's a language not unlike PL360. I have a video somewhere on YouTube where I, where I do a hello world in PL360 which is a programming language developed at Stanford University that was a mix a mixture of uh, high-level language and assembler. And PLS is pretty much the same. Now, because of its, because it's an inter... Oh, there's some, there's some mystical almost uh, approach to PLS outside in the mainframe community. It has quite a reputation because you couldn't obtain the compilers. So while we could look at the source code of the, of, uh, uh, of the, a operating system that's of MVS, etc., that's written in PLS. We can look at the source code, but we can't really, um, we can't really uh, change it or modify it because we never had the compilers. So Rand uh, went out there and created a, compil a compatible compiler, which they, uh, which worked, and I have, uh, and, and that's a great compiler, and. Um, and at a, one of the share conferences, uh, mainframe conferences, they actually distributed tapes. And IBM, uh, of course, went uh, and uh, and uh, told them to stop doing it. And so some uh, PLS compiler tapes are out there in the wild. If you have one, then you have one. If you don't have one, uh, it's very hard to obtain. And because it's so hard to obtain, it's become something of a of a uh, mythical uh, uh, construct. Uh, people would like to have it and would like to know more, but it's impossible to get it. But I have it, and and so and the other thing is that, and because it's so hard to get, and because it's an internal compiler only, there's very little documentation, even on BitSavers. There's maybe two or three manuals out there, um, and uh, and so it's hard to even if you have the compiler, it's kind of hard to uh, program in PLS because there's no manuals out there. And all manuals that are out there are extremely old. So I have some manuals, unfortunately not in PDF format. I have it in in, uh, in paper format here on my desk. Um, and I have the PLS uh, compiler compatible with the RAND compiler from the very early 70s. So, um, and none of the manuals, by the way, that I have, have a copyright by IBM, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this one on BitSavers uh, does. But the ones that I have have no copyright uh, mention whatsoever, uh, and uh, and the PLS compiler itself has no copyright mention whatsoever. So that's kind of interesting. But anyway, so that's why I'm doing a, 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 a video so that actually, you know at least we can see what it is like. So um, I'm going to switch now to my um, 
terminal and we can do some recreational programming together if you have questions of course post them in the comments and uh, uh, so we'll start with a very simple program so obviously i have the jcl here um, for the uh, for a compilation and uh, an assembly and then link and then go the interesting thing about uh, pls is that unlike pl1 which converts which goes from source code directly into object code through the linker in pls there is no it always outputs a text file which is the source code that you need to feed to the assembler so you cannot go directly from source code to uh, to link and go you always have to it, it, it basically creates a text file which you then need to feed to the assembler and then the assembler uh, and then the assembler does its job so uh, I think there is a, a diagram here somewhere I saw um, yeah here it is so from the source code uh, the PLS compiler takes it uh, does its thing creates a uh, source code for the assembler and then the assembler does its job uh, creates an object code and then you link it and then you execute it so that's the only way um, to uh, to work with the pls compiler so it's a little bit different and as i mentioned there is no pl uh, there's no input output and the the keywords that exist in pls are somewhat different some of the some of the ones are ex exactly the same as in uh, as in pl1 for instance, the declare statement, um, absolute, some built-ins are there. Um, but then there is other ones which don't exist in PL1, like such as generate, which we will use extensively, I think, in this video, um, and other um, and other such uh, keywords that don't exist in PL1. So what I want to do in this video, I don't know how long we're going to go. Uh, let's see what the interest is from the community. But I'll first do a very simple program just to show you the very basic capabilities or the most uh, significant capabilities of PLS. And then I'll do a project where I go, uh, where we do something useful with it. So I have here an empty uh, um, job stream. Let's just declutter. Okay, this needs to go anyway. Okay, so uh, PL1 and PLS are the same in that the first character, the first column needs to be empty. So we call it test procedure. And of course, then we do end test. Um, and let's do some declares declare a binary fixed 31 bit and by the way i've only started uh, using the pls compiler about three four days ago so i'm i'm learning here along with you i'm definitely not an expert in it and uh, i will be making probably lots of embarrassing uh, mistakes as we go but uh, please bear with me and so now the interesting thing that you stuff that you can do with uh, with PLS is let's say I say a equals 33 and then I say B equals 7 um, so now the interesting thing that we can do here is we can say generate code AR uh, add register AB now this is an interesting statement <coughs> because um, A has no meaning within a normal assembly if we were writing this in assembler A has no meaning right we don't have symbolic variables in uh, in assembler uh, we can create equates but other than that it's really uh, that, that's not typically something you would see um, and the other interesting thing is that we can go uh, effortlessly from PLS or almost PL1 into assembler and then out of it again and so then I can say uh, something like return code A so that's a very simple uh, PLS program and so we just declare two variables uh, binary fixed and um, so those are on the stack right 
uh, in a normal PL1 program. And then we put some values into them. And then we just say, add register uh, B to A. And then return code. So um, that's the most simple program I can think of that shows how PLS is different than PL1. Because we go from, from PLS source code to assembler and back again very transparently. All right, so um, let's let's clutter again, and uh, let's run this as A. Let's see what happens. Submit, job 136, and we go here and look at the output. So there is an error here somewhere, and then the link go went through as well. Okay, so here's the compiler output. Uh, let's see if we saw if it saw any problems. No, only informational ones has been assigned to register two and variable b has been assigned to register three so that's the interesting thing right so we use this as stack variables but pls turned them into register variables uh, because the size of the input and everything fits so it just converted them to to registers and uh and that's why uh then we can look here at the at the source code at uh, the assembler source code and let's see what it does. So it does a, a, a code section here, the prologue, which uh, saves the caller's registers, establish uh, addressability, because as you know, in MVS, all addressing is relative. So it saves uh, the caller's registers and their return, um, the return address of the caller on, uh, on our stack. And uh, then it says A33. Now, the interesting thing, if you look down a little bit, it says here in the equates, uh, A equals register 2, because if you go up just a little bit, uh, up 10, you'll see that it says uh, 2 is register 2, and A is the equate for register 2. So it creates this un indirect link, and for B the same. So B is equals, equal to the, um, to the register 3. So this way, A, even though in, within our source, it looks like it's a stack variable, it's actually indirectly put onto register. And then we have here, uh, generate code, add register B to A, and it does a B to A, and then return code. So, um, so that's very simple. So that executed fine. And uh, that's the simplest uh, PLS program that I can think of. Now, what we could do is um, do something more useful. Um, the first thing that uh, I remember doing when I learned assembler back in the days was print out the, the contents of a, of a data set onto the printer. And uh, in assembler, this would be probably something like uh, 45, maybe 50 lines of code. Let's see. Uh, how well we can do this uh, with PLS. So let's delete this. Okay. Let's reset and let's first go create some uh, data set that we want to print. Let's go to here, create a data set, allocate. Let's call it sysn. Volume serial doesn't matter right now because we're going to delete it afterwards. One track is more than enough. Um, no directory block, so it's a sequential one. Okay, so data set created. Uh, here it is. Welcome to the YouTube live stream. Let's add more than one line. And quick brown fox and uh, okay so just a little bit of test data so three lines and let's go back again to our program so obviously we need to add the sys in to the go step because we want to be able to print it out is in ah.
okay and let's also add uh, this position share oh let's just do sys out okay now let's declutter I don't like all the clutter here okay and then Okay, so what we want to do, uh, we want to read in one sequential file line by line, and then put it onto a onto the printer. So, uh, print, print it. Procedure, and let's put in here the end and print it okay let's put some declares so what do we need let's think here for a second so we need an input buffer let's make it character 80 because we defined it as record length 80 Then of course we're going to have an output buffer, out buffer, but the printer is 121 wide, so we do something like this. Uh, let's count the amount of lines we're using. We want to keep track on how many lines we have per page. So let's do yeah, we can do it as a constant. Then we need, of course, the sysprint and sysin, and we have those generated. Okay, so I think this is all we need to be able to read from a file and copy it into the printer. Um, it's a very simple program, but it will show some of the uh, capabilities of PLS. So now we need uh, data control blocks for sysin and sysprint, and uh, we're going to do it like this. I need the I need the full line because those are long lines the DCB. So let generate definitions sysin sysprint. Hold it says in, says in, I think, yeah, we did. It's partition sequential. I mean, I mean, sequential. Fixed block. We said it's an 80 bytes. The access method is GM. At when we reach the end, we go to end of file. To this uh, label let's see this is in I don't know if you can see the mouse when I use the mouse um, probably not um, okay so now we need sysprint PCB. but here we go with PM and then we say end gen. So now we're interspersing here assembler 
an assembler macro, which is the macro to create a data control block uh, with the PL PLS source code. I think that should work. Uh, I just want to be sure here, generate. Okay, 27. I was on this page before yesterday. Okay. Um, I don't see devs here. I thought I saw it. Nope. Well, let's try. The compiler will tell us. Um, let's continue. So uh, now that we have the DCB, let's do generate sets. So this is this kind of line always says I'm about to give you uh, raw assembly statements. And uh, and then you end those with uh, end gen, and anything you put in here uh, is going to be directly copied into the listing um, into the source code for the assembler. So sys in input. So we're opening input and output, as almost any programming language you need to open it. Like in basic, you would need to open it. And uh, so what do we do now? Um, let's start with an infinite loop. As long as one is bigger than zero, is greater than zero. Let's do the following. We need to get now a line, like a, a record from the input data set. Uh, so that goes into the input buffer. Referring to sysin. And we go to end of file when we've reached the end. And of course there needs an end gen. And again, this is the interesting thing that we can take a variable defined for the stack here and put it into assembler. So it is raw assembler, but it's kind of mixed with the PLS. So I really like that. Kind of like PL360, if you ever saw uh, my video on this topic. So now we'll start with uh, line count will be set later on at 55, but we go down as we get lines. So line... decrement here and of course we need to check if we are at the end of the page that means we need to put in a a uh, skip page uh, instruction to the printer oops If we are at the bottom of the page, we reset, uh, line count to the top to 55. And now we need to put in a page skip in the very first character of the line that we're about to copy into the printer. Let's put in a page skip instruction, which is this one here. And, and I think that's it. Simple and elegant. Okay. Now we uh, 
copy the what we got from the input buffer into the output buffer in preparation for printing it. So, uh, is it called out buff? Yeah. How's the quality of the stream, by the way? Is this uh, end of the audio? Is it uh, is it good enough for you guys? Okay. In the second, starting from the second position. Therefore, one. Think here, uh, plus the length. Well, do we have length here in the? Yeah, the list of all the. We have it in PL one. I'm not sure if we have it in PL. Oh yeah, we do. Oh, perfect. Very, very good. This is going to be simple. Um, length of audio is good. All right, perfect. Thank you, TRS eighty. So we copy the input buffer starting from the second position, but only for the length. So, um, yeah, I think that's correct. Excellent audio and video. Okay. I don't know if you can hear the birds outside. I'm about 40 feet from the sea. But the sea is extremely calm today. Yesterday it was extremely stormy. Uh, couldn't go out, couldn't go running. Rainy and stormy. And uh, but it's beautiful now. Uh, maybe I'll take a picture afterwards and and somehow uh, post it into the channel. I don't know how to do that, but we'll try. Um, all right. So uh, we copied the input buffer to the output buffer, starting at position two. Okay. So now we need to uh, do the put. Um, statement, the assembler statement, which is going to be something like very simple. So that's what we need to put out, but we need to enclose it into the we refer to sysprint, and we need these two things. And you guessed it, engine. So <laughs> it's a very simple program. I, mean, I told you. Um, nothing too fancy here but you don't start learning a programming language by writing a bank application uh, now of course we need to reset the 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 instruction to the printer so we do that with uh, something like this Oops, there's a, an error here. Uh, I think that's it. And we're still inside the infinite loop. And now we have the handling when we get to the end of the of the of the file, of the input file. So what do we do now? Um, let's do a label. So of course we need to close, when we reach the end, we just close everything. So, and what we close is we could put it in one line, but let's put it into two different lines. Close sys sprint and we close. And of course, okay, so let's see what's happening here. So we have the declares input buffer output buffer simple line counter max lines that looks fine so this is a bit ugly to look at but i need the full line because i don't want to go into the continuation here i guess we could do like one over but that's about it because i cannot get into this position here 
because that would signal continuation. Uh, sysprint. That looks fine to me. I don't know. I don't see. Do you see anything wrong with this? I think it's fine. Then we do the open. Then we go into this loop here. We get a card from the input. This, I'm not too sure about this flows. Let's check. Yeah, it's in 27 again. What page are we on? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, as you can see, the manual is really, it kind of, it, it, the manual is just there as a, a, as a memo, like, you know, because you learned it before. So just to look it up, but if you've never used it, and that's really the problem with PLS, there's no, it's very hard to obtain manuals and the manuals that are out there are printed and, uh, and you can imagine how many of those have survived. So I'll just go with it. Um, account, it's fine. I don't see a big problem here. I mean, this looks fine too. I think we'll just give it a try. Nothing's going to blow up. So reset the reput the clutter. Uh, okay. Why don't we just give it a try? Job one thirty seven. Oh boy, okay. It's not happy with something. Let's go find out what it is. So here are the statements that the error messages are going to refer to. This one's here. So just below here are the error messages. The comparison involving the constant one and zero is So, um, 20. So that's what it doesn't like. Is <laughs> always true. Yeah. Register optimization has been terminated because, yeah, it's always true. Smart compiler, but I know I, that's why I want to make it an infinite loop. I could just say do. All right, I mean, that's really not an error. It's perfectly legal, PO1. Uh, so let's see what the assembler says. Hmm. Sys in undefined symbol. How's that? So something is wrong here. Is this the problem? Uh, PLS is very finicky about formatting, much, much more than PL1. Let's see. Nope. Down 100.
So it's here that it has a problem with the open statement. Undefined symbol. And then, yeah, so the sysin is, didn't go through. Why did the sys, I think I know why. I know why. Uh, it wants a bit more space. As I mentioned, the formatting here is kind of important. I've seen this in my first, my previous test the last few days. Let's try like this. Yeah, looks like it's much more happy now. So the assembler didn't find any errors. As you can see, the, the formatting, it can get you uh, because you think you're doing freeform, but you're not really doing freeform. So, uh, let's see what the assembler did with this. Okay. Right, 22, I think that's what I prefer. I have a, uh, all right, so let's look at the source code here. So this is the actual source code that was fed to the assembler. This is not pseudo source code like you get when you do uh, peel one with the list parameter or COBOL with the list parameter. This is this was actually what we're looking at. This was fed to the assembler as as it shows here. So um, it didn't like the statement, but it let it go through and get this in above. Yeah. This is just a straight conversion to assembler. Okay. And then we close. And of course, a close uh, requires a, a service call. So as we see, it's like a, um, uh, like a uh, uh, how do you call them, Unix? The uh, system call. And. But the open, of course, needs an SVC and uh, and the and the close. Okay, so now let's look what the assembler did with this. So no statements flagged in this assembly. Always nice to see. And look at the output here. So welcome to the Moshex YouTube live stream, the quick brown fox and ain't no sunshine all day. So uh, so this went through. Uh, we don't like this part here, but that's because it's in the it's in the source. So if we want to remove that, we would have to go here. Oops. Uh, because if I go left you see those are there so let's run again job 140 uh, where is it here and they're gone. So that's the way to print out a, a sequential data set with PLS. We got it done, what, in 45 minutes. Now, I don't know what the interest is to do something a little bit more elaborate, like create a functionality in MVS that did not exist before. I have some ideas in mind, but uh, that's going to take another 30 minutes or so to code. Up to you if you're uh, up to uh, see me write another PLS program that actually expands the functionality of MBS. This is this we could have done in COBOL and in, in C in in, in uh, PL1 in assembler in any possible language. But uh, but if you want to do something that you cannot do uh, in any other language other than assembler or PLS, then we could do this now. Up to you. 
Otherwise, we could just uh, call this a day.